Okay, so um, first I just wanted to, to uh, reiterate thanks, but but uh, in this case, direct my thanks, uh, especially to Keith. Where is Keith? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, you're in my seat. Um, we're role reversing. Um, working through this material was enormously helpful. I, I, I'm somewhat embarrassed to say that uh, when I sat down to embark on this project, I didn't know in advance whether I was an illusionist or not. And so part of this has been a self-discovery. I know I, everyone seems to know that I was not, but this is a, a failure of self-knowledge, I guess. So um, I had to reflect on it a little bit. Um, there's this, there's this famous episode or, or apocryphal episode from the history of philosophy where uh, Alexander uh, the Great goes to see Diogenes in his bathtub and, and um, he says, I'll grant you anything. I'm a big admirer of yours. And, and Diogenes says, yes, my one wish is that you get out of my sunlight. At which point Alexander says, were I not Alexander, I would be Diogenes. And I think all of us in philosophy have views or, which are the, the views we could characterize as the kind of uh, diogenic, diogenic ones, which are the kinds of ones we would be if we weren't who we were. And uh, so for me, illusionism is kind of the view I would want to have if I didn't have the, 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 the opposing <laughs> realism view. Um, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but of course, of course, we know philosophical poles are not, are, you know, not a single dimension with two ends, but kind of branch out in equi, equidistant oppositions. And uh, there are many ways to be an opposite of a, of a kind of materialist realist, which is what I actually am. And of the ways of being the opposite of a materialist realist, the one I would most uh, be most comfortable with, I'd sleep best at night with, which is not to say I sleep well at night, um, would be illusionism. So, so uh, this might be an exercise in, in um, in some sort of self-immolation, um, because by the end of our dialogue, I may find myself uh, being Diogenes. Um, OK, so um, uh, the title, Reconstructing Magic Qualia, is sort of a way, a way of gesturing at this idea uh, that, that maybe there's a way to be a materialist, but, but keep a, a rich view of qualia uh, in. So I want to talk about this. Some of you may recognize this little nice color uh, sample which is not just a, a, a pretty collection of abstract forms, but is actually a close-up of this uh, self-portrait um, by Chuck Close. So um, uh, this is a kind of a elaborate metaphor for, for the theme I'm going to defend. Um, I want to do a little historical tour. Um, this is a, a picture of, uh, of Puti, or these little uh, cherubic angels fighting each other. Um, and I just wanted to remind ourselves that the battles that we see in, in reviewing the papers over this conference, uh, which, are, which are multiple, but there are certain core themes. One of them is methodological. And there are people, I think, in this group who's ten, who tend to approach questions of consciousness from a very a priori perspective, and others who are really uh, trying to um, uh, let their, um, their understanding of the, or interpretation of the empirical evidence drive their conclusions. And this is an old debate. So I've substituted in for these putti heads the heads of two, two uh, representatives of this debate. And some of you will recognize on the left, uh, uh, that's Francis Bacon, uh, one of the founders of modern science, and to his right, René Descartes. And uh, Bacon was very vociferous in arguing that we should, we should let our theories be dictated by, by empirical evidence, where Descartes thought a method of, of deduction was, um, was more uh, valuable in, in these domains. So deduce versus uh, observe. And uh, we can see that methodological debate arising in this group. But I also want to point out that even though we, we as philosophers read Descartes as a big fan of deductive methods, if you look at the Cartesian corpus more broadly, he thinks that often observation is the key. And so ironically, he says when we get to the body, what we should do is observation and let science dictate our theories of how bodies work. And uh, this is less known, but for those of you who have had the pleasure of reading Francis Bacon, uh, oddly enough, when he gets to the mind, he says let something a priori work. In fact, um, uh, like Descartes, uh, Bacon tries to divide the mind into two different aspects of the mental, basically the animal spirits and the soul. And he says the animal spirits you can study through observation, but the soul you, just stu you study not through deduction, but through revelation. Um, so fascinating uh, way in which these two, I think, um, uh, you might say vanguard figures for these 
do different methods end up being inconsistent in their own application of them. And I think all of us are messier. And so many of us who are, who are committed naturalists but, but do philosophy in a way that's not particularly um, driven by, by reading empirical studies and, and, um, and we see all kinds of variations in this room. So to the extent we've seen polar divisions, we've also seen, and I think this comes out very strongly in our discussion, the ability to talk to each other and learn from each other and a, a mutual respect for the, the lessons that can be learned from all these different methodologies. Um, Descartes, of course, on these issues, uh, thought that deduction would lead us uh, to the view that uh, the idea that mentality comes from matter is inconceivable. So mind as matter, asked Descartes, inconceivable. This is Hobbes, and I don't think we read enough Hobbes in philosophy of mind. Hobbes is an early practitioner of materialism, and often quite interesting. One of the fascinating bits of the Hobbes um, uh, view of the mind that we haven't uh, spent enough time with is he asks, could mind be soul stuff? Could it be immaterial? Inconceivable. So we tend to think of conceivability arguments running one way, showing that it's inconceivable that matter could produce mentality. But Hobbes thought that it's inconceivable that this ethereal soul stuff could produce mentality. And with the exception of Paul Churchland in this room, who's tried to ar argue this way in, in some of his treatments of the, of the knowledge argument, I think, or Pat too, I, I think that, well, I'm actually, Dan has argued this way too, so this is a good, <laughs> this, is a, this is a very Hobbesian room. Uh, I think we should take seriously that the, the puzzles associated with trying to account for the mental um, arise for both materialist and non-materialist perspectives. Now Hobbes is maybe a slightly unsung hero in this score, but we all sing Hobbes praises in other contexts, or often we complain about Hobbes in other contexts. But I want to mention uh, someone else, who is Demaris Masham. Who in Masham was a... Um, was the daughter, daughter of Cudworth, who some of you will know is an important um, moral rationalist. And she was a quite an accomplished philosopher in her own right. And a regular uh, interlocutor with, um, uh, with, with John Locke. And she uh, developed this argument, an argument for the view that the mental cannot be um, uh, non-physical. Um, in, in greater detail than you find in Hobbes. So if you want to find a, a locus classicus for this argument, an inconceivable ability argument that drives the conclusion that soul stuff couldn't produce mentality, uh, Masham is somebody who's worth, worth consulting. And I think these arguments uh, deserve our attention. So mind stuff is soul stuff. Like Hobbes, she says inconceivable. But she gives a better argument than Hobbes gives. And her dog contributes, too. <laughs> um, <laughs> Now, oh, so we have two views. We have a view that mind stuff can't come from soul stuff. We have a view that mind stuff can't come from physical stuff, that it, bo both of these are inconceivable. Um, so people have argued on each side. And Locke argued both sides. Locke is famously inconsistent. If you read the essay, he says P and not P on alternate pages. And uh, sometimes he explicitly says P and not P, as in this wonderful quote. Uh, some men, because of the unconceivableness of something they find in one, throw themselves violently into the contrary hypothesis, though altogether as unintelligible to an unbiased understanding. So what Hobbes is saying, uh, what uh, Locke is saying here, is that basically the, the dualists like Descartes see the idea of mind coming from matter as inconceivable. So they violently throw themselves behind the view that mind must therefore come from soul stuff. But that's equally unintelligible, says Locke. So there are puzzles on both sides. Anyway, let's fast forward. This was just a bit of, of background. Um, so fasting forward, uh, uh, if you look at um, Keith's work, one of the things he does is nicely presents various options that are on the table for thinking about relationship between uh, the mental and the physical, and particularly he's focusing on qualia. And all of these positions can be uh, structured around the, the hypothesis or the, the, the belief that qualia are fundamentally weird. And I'm going to talk about what that weirdness consists in in, in just a minute. But um, you might say, look, qualia are very, very weird things. Therefore, we should be dualists. That would be one kind of position. Dualists. <laughs> dualists. We should be dualists. Yeah. Um, <laughs> dualium. We dualium. Therefore, dualium. <laughs> uh, this is like Dada poetry. Um, perch fitters would be pleased. Um, Another view would be that quality just aren't so weird. They're not nearly as weird as they've been made out to be. So we can easily reduce them to something physical. So that's another kind of view. 
A third kind of view, and this is an interesting one that's really at the heart of illusionism, is that let's grant that qualia are weird, but because dualism is impalatable for various reasons, we should try to explain them away. Grant the weirdness, but say that weirdness can be explained away. And I think for people, people uh, like like Dan or, or or Nick or Keith, this is a, a, a sort of a first approximate characterization of the strategy. But there's another view that gets a little less uh, airtime in, in some of the papers we read from Keith, but it certainly comes out in other work by him and, and people in this room, is granting the weirdness of qualia but saying we can nevertheless account for that weirdness in materialist terms. And some people, I think Paul uh, is, a, is a wonderful exemplar of this in the readings uh, that he contributed to our workshop, um, and it's the view that I want to defend. So grant the weirdness, but say there's no problem in, in accounting for weirdness in materialist terms. How far we can account for them will vary from person to person, and I think Paul and I would disagree about whether the accounts we come up with will leave gaps or not. So I want to suggest there's another flavor of ice cream that deserves to be uh, included. I, I made it into the pistachio or mint ice cream on the grounds that I think pistachio and mint are better flavors than chocolate, strawberry, and vanilla. So I wanted to make, yeah. So, <laughs> um, so labeling a bit following Keith. So you might say the person who's a dualist, who grants the weirdness, but says, therefore, we need to go in some sort of non-materialist direction, that would be what he calls radical realism. And so here's the, this kind of mysterious ethereal stuff <laughs> rising out of the, it's very nice to see. I wish I had a camera to take, take uh, there's smoke rising from, from your head um, uh, right now, Dave. Uh, so another sort of view would be a reductive, reductive realism. And for the reductive realist, you want to say, oh, no, I can explain qualia in terms of something physical like, like, like the brain. So you try and reduce. And part of what we're going to get to is there might be different kinds of reductive realism. The kind that Keith focuses on is the person who first tries to denature qualia, tries to make them less weird, and after making them less weird, reduces them to the brain. And finally, there's illusionism, and Keith's very uh, uh, very helpfully reintroduces um, uh, this figure from Nick. Um, and what you get is saying it looks paradoxical, looks exceptionally weird when you encounter it. But when you change your perspective on it a little bit, you discover it's not so uh, weird after all. It's, a, it's just an illusion. So that's, that's the illusionist perspective. Qualia seem weird. They are weird, but they're only sort of intentional objects. They don't really exist. They're projections of the imagination. Another bit of terminology, uh, qualia can be defined in ways that are minimal uh, or magical. We can think, try and reduce them and say there's something sort of je just phenomenal qualities and they don't have all these special features. Or they, you might say they have a whole bunch of very special puzzling features. So on a minimal view, you might say qualia are whatever cause our belief in qualia. That's, that's a characterization that Keith comes to in one of the papers. Uh, and that would be, you might, you might describe them in terms of phenomenal character. But on this very denatured view, the, your account of what phenomenal character consists in is nothing more than they cause these beliefs that we're having qualitative states. The magical view says quality have these really special features. They're subjective, they're ineffable, they're intrinsic, they're immediate, and they're infallible. And, and maybe we can come up with some others. So very special features. In, in one of the papers we read, uh, Keith refers to a, uh, the, the minimal view as a diet quality of view, as opposed to a classical quality of view. Okay, the, the minimal is the zero. Uh, so minimal, minimal, is zero. minimal is zero. Well, that diet is supposed to be uh, a kind of theory neutral motion between. Okay, the okay. So minimal is zero, and diet is the so diet should be on top there, where it says minimal, right? Uh, it's a minimal is zero. I use minimal and zero. This, uh, you try and but you, it's the same. It means the same thing. It's okay. Paper, so it's just confusing. But diet was supposed to be something that doesn't have a commitment to magicality and doesn't. Uh, oh, isn't explicitly minimal either. Okay, good. So, so, so the key, the key terminology here might be diet versus versus classical. That might, those are the terms we should, we should focus on. And here's a dilemma. So this is a sort of reformulation of I think a, a one of the core um, outcomes of, of Keith's work here. And on the first horn of the dilemma, you might imagine a diet qualia theorist saying, look, well, if we deny mysteriousness, let's let's just deny that qualia are mysterious. Let's go that route. Let's say qualia are not that mysterious at all. Have a diet theory of qualia where they don't have these special qualities like infallibility and affability and so on. But if you go this route, you're going to first of all ending up collapsing into a zero qualia view. 
once you've done this, you've taken so much out of the, the characterization that's classical in presenting qualia that it's not clear you're talking about qualia at all. But worse still, it's not just that you've collapsed qualia into nothing, which is a view that Keith ultimately endorses. You've basically, by denying mysteriousness, left yourself with no explanation of the fact that most of the population does think qualia are pretty mysterious. So we lose the manifest image. If you deny mysteriousness, you end up not only with a zero qualia view, but you haven't done anything to account for the apparent weirdness that others are so moved by. Well, suppose you accept mysteriousness. If you accept mysteriousness, then you're going to end up with dualism. And if you're a dualist, he thinks you're most likely going to be forced in the corner of epiphenomenalism. And that, too, is a violation of the manifest image. So dualists who say they're trying so hard to get the manifest image right by making qualia mysterious end up being uh, great, uh, great violators of the manifest image by saying qualia have no causal impact. So these are both very unattractive positions. We can't say qualia are mysterious, and we can't say that they're not. So we're stuck without an option. And the genius um, of, of Keith's uh, presentation of the um, illusionism position is he shows that the illusionism position, in principle, can navigate a course between the horns of this dilemma. So in particular, if we grant that qualia seem mysterious, not that they actually are, but that they seem mysterious, and come up with some account of why they seem mysterious, um, uh, then, um, then we can uh, have uh, a position where we take mysteriousness seriously without epiphenomenalism, without collapsing into uh, this, this uh, unattractive dualist position. And the way to do that is to say qualia are a kind of projection. They're not really out there, but we, we project them, we superimpose them onto the world as if they were there, and that takes mysteriousness seriously without losing materialism. So that's the illusionist position. And it's, um, it's a big pay, it's a very attractive position. It's an attractive position because like this, um, person here, she has her cake. Um, she has mysteriousness of qualia. She has that. But she can eat her cake, too, by having no mysterious ontology. So mysterious qualia without the mysterious ontology. OK, so that's attractive. So now I'll end with just some, some questions for the view. Um, Maybe I'll skip this slide because I, I, there, there are some things in the first paper. It's going to talk about demonstrative theories of, of um, diet qualia, but I'll, I'll skip over that. So first, I want to suggest that illusionism, and, and Keith is very upfront about this, may have some costs. So adopting illusionism doesn't keep everything intact. We do It is a revisionist view in various ways. Um, first of all, it, and this is something that came out earlier today, it might reintroduce a kind of theater. So one question for discussion is, does illusionism commit too much to a Cartesian theater? After all, um, not only, not only is, the, is there a, a position associated with Dan that, that the science cannot establish the reality of a Cartesian theater, but the claim that from a perspective of phenomenology we have a Cartesian theater is itself subject to various doubts. It's not obvious to me, at least, that there's anything like a unified single stream of consciousness where everything comes together. And one might wonder, I don't think, strictly speaking, illusionism is committed to this view, but in developing an illusionist view, how far illusionism should go in, in accommodating the so-called classical qualia uh, picture. Um, another thing, obviously, it's built into the title, illusionism is committed to the view that we're subject to an illusion. Putting it a little bit less politely, you might say, we're committed to a profound error. We think these special things exist, and they don't. That, uh, that might be considered a cost of the view. Um, it's, a very, it's a conceptually demanding view, potentially, in the following way. When you have a judgment, I'm currently having an experience of this particular taste or this particular color, you need to, on a certain formulation of illusionism, deploy a concept, a concept of a specific taste or a specific color. If you have the view that qualitative character greatly outstrips our conceptual repertoire, that qualia are somehow non-conceptual, are more finely grained than our conceptual resources, then any attempt to account for, for belief in qualia by appeal to concepts might prove problematic, might posit more concepts than we actually possess. And a further thing is, while there's been this great effort to avoid dualism precisely because of its epiphenomenalism, there's a way in which the illusionist is an epiphenomenalist, too. Because they say qualia are merely intentional objects. They don't actually exist. We just project them. But those intentional objects don't have any causal effects. Just our beliefs in them have an effect. So these are, these are some potential costs. So if there were a cheaper theory, we might want to consider it. 
So um, maybe in a way illusionism is granting too much to the dualist. Maybe we should have stopped earlier on in the debate, back with this Hobbesian point, and say that maybe we should, maybe weirdness can be accommodated within a materialist perspective. So the, I think the main competitor to an illusionist view would take weirdness seriously, just like illusionism, but instead of trying to explain it away, it would just try to explain it simpliciter. Um, so accounting for weirdness, I'll be very, very quick here. I just want to rehearse these features of weirdness that Keith itemizes in his paper and suggest that um, there are strategies in the literature for thinking about these features in a materialist way. So believing that these features are true of experience, but not trying to say they're merely, merely an illusion, instead trying to account for them. So Paul has this nice discussion of subjectivity in his, uh, in his color paper, and there are various strategies for trying to explain the subjectivity of experience in physicalist or materialist terms. You might, for example, emphasize the perspectival nature. Each each of us has a unique, a totally unique um, physical representation or physical response to the perceptual world. And to that extent, nobody can know what any other person's response is um, through, this, through this first personal way. Our access to what, the way we're currently representing the world is to that extent privileged because others looking at us or looking at the same uh, stimulus might represent things differently. With respect to ineffability, um, you might say, well, if, if qualia are couched in some bit of the nervous system that is nonverbal or preverbal or non-conceptual, as again, people like Paul and Pat have, have argued, then the fact that these things don't map onto uh, uh, spoken language is just falls directly out of the theory. Intrinsicality. So there are people in the physicalist world who try and give relational theories of qualia. So representationalists have, have a view that qualia can be identified by what they represent in the world. But a lot of physical reductionists, neural reductionists, who try to explain qualia in terms of, uh, say, neural dynamics of, of populations of cells in the nervous system, do have a kind of intrinsicness view. They say the qualitative character supervenes on some population of neurons, not what they relate to out there in the world. So intrinsicness is to some extent accommodated, or one might say falls out of the physicalist position. Epistemic immediacy. Now, all of us just have to grant from the get-go, and, and Dan's work is full of examples that should convince us of this, that we, we make a lot of errors. In some sense, reporting about qualitative experience is radically fallible. We make all kinds of mistakes. You still might Oh, sorry, this is immediacy, is, is, is radically mediated. We, we, we have all these ways of sort of having to translate qualitative experience into other forms of representation to present them to others. But there's another sense in which, according to a standard materialist view, merely being in the right physical state, in the right brain state, is tantamount to having an experience, and therefore, in that extent, directly and immediately knowing what that experience is like. So you can have a count of phenomenal knowledge of what it is like to be in a certain uh, sensory state that's based on the fact that just being in that state constitutes a form of knowledge. And again, people like Paul have, have argued for this. So I think a materialist has some account of immediacy that's just built into the theory. We know qualia through the qualia, not through something else. We know it directly. And finally, on infallibility, you might say, well, of course, and this, this is the point I, I made a second ago, of course we know we're very fallible. We make all kinds of mistakes. But those mistakes might issue from the fact that when we present our qualia uh, conceptually, either for our own uh, self-descriptions or when we're trying to describe to others what we're experiencing, we need to translate what we're experiencing into something like language or some sort of conceptual um, repertoire which might be very, very different in its um, expressive scope than, than the quality of themselves. And there's all kinds of room for, for error here. Take emotion. You might have a case where somebody says, how are you feeling? And you have to decide, you know, is this love or is this lust? And what you do is you sort of introspect, and on the basis of what you're experiencing, you label this. And the labeling can go wildly wrong. So there's this classic experiment by uh, Dutton and Aaron where they, they ask this question, more or less, on a, on a very scary suspension bridge. And people who are, are terrified on this bridge think they, they're, they're, they're attracted to a, a person on that bridge, when in fact it's misidentifying the arousal of fear, arguably, for the arousal of, of attraction. And um, so, but that's a kind of fallibility. But in another sense, you might say they're infallible. That is, this direct experience of the bodily state 
is in some sense accurate. The inaccuracy is a reporting problem. It's not, a, if you're talking about the direct experience itself, in some sense you get a kind of infallibility. So people have an intuition that qualia are really weird and that unlike everything else, there's a way in which we know them infallibly. That might be true. If you can know a qualitative state by having it, by being in the right brain state, there's a sense in which that knowledge is direct and hence to that degree infallible. The errors come in with description. So if we had to pick between these theories to wrap up, I think materialist accounts have a bunch of strategies and one thing I think we should discuss is how successful or hopeless those strategies are for trying to account for weirdness. What are the best materialist strategies for doing this? I'm sure non-materialists in the room won't be very moved by the, by the brief suggestions just made. Um, in fact, one can go further and say if you take a standard materialist theory about what qualia are, these features are actually, I think, to a large extent entailed by those theories. They fall out of those theories. And if you tried to take a dualist theory and say, does dualism entail infallibility, immediacy? Does it, does it entail these features that are sort of listed as weirdness features in Keith's work? Not obvious at all. They seem to be add-ons. You need to build into the theory that this is, uh, this is uh, true, that soul stuff is, say, known immediately. Um, so um, if you compare this to illusionism, um, I think illusionism, unlike, unlike illusionism, the materialist reduction of qualia of weird qualia is committed to less error. There's probably still some error there, but less error. It avoids epiphenomenalism. Qualia are just these special kinds of brain states which might do all kinds of causal work. And you don't need to posit a set of rich concepts that are involved in our self-attribution of, uh, of beliefs about, about qualia. So uh, some final just questions for further discussion. Um, Keith mentions this secondary quality analogy for how to think about um, phenomenal knowledge. And I think illusionism really can't help itself to a secondary quality view, in part because the standard view of secondary quality says we know something by our response to it, where that response is then thought to be characterized in some sort of phenomenological terms. So I don't think secondary qualities work out to be the best analogy for the illusionist position. Um, we might ask, why do we have this illusion? If you're an illusionist, you need to explain why the illusion arises. And um, Nick has written quite, quite a bit about this in interesting ways, so that's a, a question we can, we can discuss more. Um, uh, I think Keith's uh, focusing on a kind of dualist position and a dualist position that has a particular feature, epiphenomenalism, but of course we know there are many other non-materialist positions and I think uh, uh, right now there's been a, a move towards various forms of monism and I think if, if um, Keith had to address uh, Dave's current position, uh, the, the arguments in these papers would need to be supplemented, so we want to invite that conversation. Uh, so if we go back to Masham, who has these conceivability arguments, a question we can reflect on is, can you construct conceivability arguments against non-materialist positions uh, to help the dualist out? Have, have an illusionist, in a certain way, taken dualism too seriously. Maybe we should have never, never gotten that far. And finally, at the end of his uh, paper, uh, Keith suggests that there might be a role for experimental philosophy. And one thing I'd like to do over remaining days here is, is reflect collectively about whether there is a role for, for experimental philosophy in advancing some of these um, debates. And I will stop there. Sorry I went so long.